Have you ever wondered how you can create a scrolling texture effect like this? Or a distortion effect? You probably quickly learned that Unity's shader graph can help you with that. However, did you ever wonder what all of the nodes in shader graph do and how people seem to intuitively know when to add nodes together, when to multiply them, and where to connect them? Have you ever been in awe of the people who seem to magically pull these nodes out of a hat to create a beautiful shader? I certainly have, and now I want to show you how a shader graph works, what the nodes actually do, and how you can build an understanding of how to combine the nodes into powerful shaders. In this video, we will focus on shaders that render a surface's color. Specifically, we will dive into how shaders can manipulate the UV mapping to create fun effects such as scrolling textures. Before we get going, be sure to subscribe to the channel if you want to be notified of more content like this and leave a like if you enjoyed the video. Okay, let's get started. This video is structured into three main parts. First, we'll briefly go over what UV mapping is and how it can be used to texture paint a 3D object. We will then write our first very simple shader in Shader Graph. Then we will dive into a slightly more complex shader that will manipulate a surface's UV mapping to create a scrolling texture effect. In this third section, I will not only tell you what nodes you can use to achieve this effect, but I will also cover what each individual node does, what information a node provides to Shader Graph, and how Shader Graph communicates that information back to you, the developer. At the end of the video, you should understand what each of the nodes return, what the node previews mean, and how the shader uses all the nodes to render what you want. Before we get started with the shaders, let's briefly look at what UV mapping is. If you're not familiar with UV mapping, you can find a detailed explanation of it by checking out my video about texture painting. Just to summarize, UV mapping is a process of mapping the surface of a 3D object onto a 2D texture. Let's look at a very simple example, just to get warmed up a bit. Let's say we have this cube here. We can generate a UV layout of this cube. A UV layout is a 2D representation of the cube's surfaces. Our 3D modeling suite, in this case Blender, can tell us exactly which face of the 3D object corresponds to which part of the UV layout. That is essentially UV mapping. The 3D coordinates of the 3D object's surface, represented as X, Y, and Z, are mapped to 2D coordinates on the texture represented as U and V. U is the position on the horizontal axis, and V the position on the vertical axis of the texture. Knowing this mapping, we can export this UV layout to a PNG file and import it into our favorite image editing suite. Since we now know which part of the UV layout corresponds to which part of the 3D model, we can start painting the UV layout accordingly. We can then reapply the painted texture back to our 3D model and voila, we have successfully UV mapped our 3D object and painted on it. Now let's have a look at what a shader is. A shader is a small program that tells the computer how to position a given vertex of a 3D model or how to color a given point on a 3D model surface. In other words, a shader allows you to hook into the rendering pipeline and manipulate how an object's geometry is rendered and how it is colored. A shader that allows you to manipulate the geometry is called a vertex shader. Vertex shaders can be used to create waves for water, for example, by changing the position of the object's vertices over time. A shader that allows you to manipulate the color of a 3D object surface is called a fragment shader. We will focus on the fragment shader in this video. Let's create a simple shader to start with. In this video, we will create our shaders with Unity's shader graph. To do this, navigate to a folder in your assets where you want to store your shader, right click and create shader graph, URP, unlit shader graph. What you see here is a shader graph. You see two nodes, a vertex node and a fragment node. We will focus on the fragment node for now. This node is responsible for providing the color of any given point on a 3D object surface. Let's define a color property, give it a default color and drag it into the graph. Let's now wire our color property up with the base color property of the fragment shader. If we now create a material from this shader and apply it to a 3D model, we see the color we defined in the shader. By defining the color property in the shader graph, we actually also expose it to the material. This means we can change the color of our shader in the material. Let's now go back to our shader, add a second color property and multiply it with the first color. This allows us to mix colors much like we could do in an image editing suite. In the image editing suite, we can accomplish the same exact effect by setting the blend mode of two colors to multiply. Now we created our very first, very simple shader that allows us to mix two colors together. In our simple shader example, we provided two colors as inputs to our shader. Shader graph can take a lot of other types of inputs as well, and not just the inputs you expose. One type of input shader graph can use is the UV coordinates of an object. Let me show you what I mean. Let's create another shader in Shader Graph. First, we will add a UV node. 
This node provides the shader access to the UV coordinates of a model surface. Let's look at this node in a bit more detail. This part here is the output of the node. If you think of the node as a function, this is the return type. In the case of the UV node, the output is a vector 4, which is a four-dimensional vector. The first two values of the 4D vector are the U and V values. In our case, we only care about these two values and the remaining two values of the vector can be ignored. Now, what can be a bit confusing is that the output is shown as a single vector 4. However, I find it easier to look at it as a table of vector 4s. Each vector 4 in the table represents a single UV coordinate of the model surface. The vectors are usually normalized, which means their values range from 0 to 1. The bottom left UV coordinate of the surface is represented as a vector with values 0, 0, and the top right UV coordinate is represented as a vector with values 1, 1. All remaining UV coordinates have values between 0, 0 and 1, 1. This table of vectors that represents a surface's UV coordinates is basically what Shader Graph uses in its computation. This numeric format may work very well for Shader Graph, but it can be a bit difficult to understand what the visual impacts of a table like this can be. This is why Shader Graph also provides a visual preview of each node that uses colors to represent the numbers. The colors make it much easier to understand how various nodes affect the table of vectors. For vectors, a vector with values 0, 0 is represented as black, and a vector with values 1, 1 is represented as yellow. So our UV nodes preview shows a nice gradient from black in the bottom left to yellow in the top right. If all the vectors in our table had the same color, we would not have a gradient, but just that single color in the preview. If you are wondering why Shader Graph uses these particular colors to represent these particular values, there is an explanation. A vector of 1, 1 expressed as an RGB color vector is 1, 1, 0. This vector has maximum values for the red and green channels. Maximum values for red and green make yellow. This is also why the top left corner of the preview of our UV node, which hosts the vector 0, 1, is green, and the bottom right corner of our preview, which hosts the vector 1, 0, is red. As a quick aside, if we instead have a node of which the return type is a table of scalars, the preview shows a gray scaled color. Black represents a value of 0 and white a value of 1. This is because for scalar values, each value in the RGB color vector is the same. So a scalar value of 0 is represented as an RGB color vector 0, 0, 0, and a scalar of 1 as an RGB color vector of 1, 1, 1. All values in between are also always evenly applied to all components of the vector, leading to different tones of gray. Now, if a node produces a table with varying scalar values, we get a grayscaled gradient. Okay, so we have this UV node that essentially just provides us with the UV coordinates of an object's surface. Let's now add a Texture 2D node. This node samples the color of a texture at a given UV coordinate and outputs it. The texture it will sample can be provided with this texture input. The UV coordinates it will use to decide where in the texture to sample the color can be provided here. Let's now wire up our UV node with this texture node. If we look at the preview, we see the texture. This makes sense because a texture is nothing more than a table of colors. Essentially, the texture node takes in the table of UVs and converts it into a table of colors by sampling the color of the provided texture at each UV coordinate. We can now wire up the color output of this node to the color property of our fragment shader and voila, we have a shader that can sample a texture. We can once again create a material from this shader and apply it to our object. Nothing all too fancy. This is literally what every basic material in Unity can already do. So let's make it a bit more interesting. Let's add an input called offset of type vector2 and give it a value of negative 0.5, negative 0.5. Let's add this offset to the output of our UV node and see what happens. Looking at the add node, we see that its output is a vector2. That makes sense. We are adding a 2D vector, our offset, to another 2D vector, in this case our truncated UV vector. Remember, we are only working with the U and V parts of the original 4D UV vector. Its visual representation is again this color gradient because that's how tables of vectors are represented, but this time the bottom left quadrant is black. Before we added our offset, this table essentially looked like this. Once we added our offset, or rather subtracted 0 0.5, 0 0.5 from each vector value in the table, our table looks like this. Values below 0 are also represented with a black color. This explains why the bottom left quadrant is black, because all the values in the bottom left are negative. No part of the gradient reaches the yellow color anymore because our table no longer contains a vector of 1, 1. It goes from negative 0 0.5, negative 0 0.5 to positive 0 0.5, positive 0 0.5. It also means that our UV vector that was at the bottom left before our addition, vector 0, 0, is now at the center. 
where the texture node previously sampled a color at UV coordinate 0 0.5, 0 0.5 from its texture, it is now sampling the color at UV coordinate 0 0.0, 0 0.0. What we have done here is we have shifted our UV by 50% to the right and up. We can get a bit fancier now and change this offset over time to create a scrolling texture. Let's add a time node. This node emits an ever increasing number as time goes on. Let's feed the output of that node to our addition node. Now we are changing the offset to our UV over time. This means the texture node will sample colors at ever-changing UV coordinates from its texture. This results in a scrolling texture effect. This is an effect that is commonly used by games to create things like flowing water, for example. And there you have it, a shader that is manipulating the UVs of a 3D object before rendering a texture onto it. So that's basically it. Let's briefly recap what we covered. We first briefly looked at UV mapping and texture painting to get an understanding of how a 3D object's surfaces can be represented in a 2D texture. We wrote a very simple shader that mixes two colors together to get a basic understanding of what a shader is. We wrote a slightly more complex shader that creates a scrolling texture effect by combining what we know about UV mapping with what we learned about various nodes in Shader Graph. Particularly at the end, we dove deeply into what the individual nodes of the Shader Graph mean, how they are represented in the previews, and how to combine them with and connect them to other nodes. This video only scratched the surface of Shader Graph. It aims to provide a fundamental understanding of how Shader Graph works so that you can learn about new nodes on your own and understand what the nodes mean and how to combine and connect them together. If you notice any inaccuracies in my explanations or can provide more clear explanations, feel free to leave a comment. If you like the video, also feel free to leave a comment. The feedback will be very much appreciated. That's it for now. Thanks for watching and see you next time.